It's Father's Day, and for just a moment, I want to take a few moments to share with you some very wonderful things, but I also need to preface this by telling you that sometimes in order to get to the great, you have to go through the not so good, and sometimes you have to travel through some difficult waters in order to get to the blessing that God has for us, and so I don't want to ever come across as a negative person or preacher. I'm not that. In fact, I'm one of the most positive people you'll ever meet. If you've met me, I hope that you say that, and I didn't hear anyone say, ouch, so I believe you know that, but I'm kind of like the eternal optimist who went golfing at the course the second year. He golfed it the year before, and then he went back to the golf course the second year, and he teed up the ball, and he took out his nine iron, and he swung, and he went right over top of the ball, missed it completely, and turned to his golfing buddy, and he said, you know, since the last time we played this course, they've lowered it. But I am the eternal optimist, I really believe, because when you're connected to God, you're happy. When you're connected to God, you feel, you're filled with joy and peace. And, and so I don't apologize for that. I, I'm thankful for the goodness of God in your lives and ours, and even in the most difficult, troubling, trying times, that God is always good. And I preached that a few weeks ago. But in order to get to where I want to get to this morning for just a moment, I need to tell you this. Our nation, America, this great... Uh, a home, the land of the free, the home of the brave, this, this great red, white, and blue star-spangled banner, this incredible nation comprised of 50 states and multiple nationalities, cultures from all around the world, people that make up this mighty mosaic of a melting pot of the diversity of lives that, that comprise of what we call America today is in trouble. America is confronted with some very stark and real situations that are happening right before our very eyes. I have to believe this morning that you are here and you're alive in this generation because God destined you to be a part of changing the way things are. That you're not a biological accident that just happened to be, but that you are part of God's plan for turning America around. But I think we would all have to say without at the risk of sounding negative or pessimistic that America is in trouble that we need a mighty mighty intervention of a divine power to turn this thing around and God works through people just like you and I but as we sit in this wonderful comfortable cozy sanctuary that is placed uh, uh, strategically in 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 the, the 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 area called Hernando County this little hideaway tucked in here safe from a lot of what is going on in the rest of the big bad world today, we must remember that it affects all corners of America, that it affects small town, big town, large cities, and even rural communities. There is an underworld and a shadow government that is very much at work in America today. There is anarchy that we are witnessing right on our very streets in the nation today. There is trouble with our teenagers. People are trying to pull down and destroy our current government. Government. Our economic system is very volatile right now. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going through a very serious transition. There are things happening in America today that ought to cause the people of God to stand up, wake up, and speak up, and start to say it's time we realized that we can be not quiet people sitting by, tucked in the corner of our complacent Christian lifestyle, but start to say, God, if you can do anything, if you can use anyone, God, use me. If if I can be a voice, if I can be something that can be spoken through God, let it happen in me. Step outside of your complacent lifestyle. Step outside of your, your comfort zone, if it's so be called that. Let's step outside of what we feel good about and start saying, God, you have a plan for my life and a purpose. And it's not an accident that I'm alive in 2020. There's a reason why I'm here today. There's a reason why you've put your hand upon my life. And it's to not only change your world, but it's to change the world. The Bible says everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that the things that stand will remain. And so it continues even in America today that unless we see something happen, America will cease to exist as we know America now. 
Now, I realize that even in our past generations and, and family genealogies that they went through tragic times and difficult battles and wars. But you know what? We can handle a war that's visible. It's the invisible enemy that's a little harder to handle. It's, you know, back there you had a man on the front lines with a rifle in his hand or a tank or an M16 or, or, or a plane flying over. At least you knew and saw your enemy. But today he's covert. He's behind the scene. He's working outside of the visible eye. And so if ever there was a time that the body of Christ needed to discern the things of the spirit. It's now. Can you say amen? The survival of our nation depends on th this one thing. Of course, it's easy to just simply uh, put it to the side and say the survival of America depends on God. That's the easy way out. It's just to say God's in charge. God is in control. God has everything in his hands. God's going to not let things happen. If that be the case, why are things happening today? Why are young men killed in the streets? Why are tra families torn apart? Why is there tragedy, travesty, and trouble all around us today? It's because man has been given free will man has the power to choose man can choose God or man can choose the ways of the world and there are many today that have forfeited God and chosen to go their own way the way the way the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto man but the end thereof is death and so man has made a choice it is our job today not to just simply point to God all the time and say God will take care of it but to say that we are the ambassadors of God we are the ones who God has chosen we are the ones whom God has placed his hand upon that we would carry out the work of God now let me explain that to you this morning because the survival of America depends on one thing of course God is the one who holds all things in his hands but the survival of America today is based upon the survival of the family the family is not made up of perfect people I didn't think I'd have a hard time getting you to shout amen there. The family is not made up of perfect marriages. The family is what God ordained because there's no such thing as a perfect family and there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. But the family is what God ordained, not some liberal psychology, psychology counselor in a university, not some person in the American government, not even the church of Jesus Christ is what, is what God is talking about. He is saying that the family unit is because God is the one who designed it who architecturally put it together and the family is designed by God and God began it all in Genesis and he said Adam and Eve uh, as a man and a woman and if I can just stop right there for a moment and let you be reminded of the fact that there is not 211 different biological species in the world, in the human race. There are two. God established that a long time ago. One is called a man and one is called a woman. One is called a male and one is called a female. And if you don't know the difference, come and see me after the service and I'll get my biology book out and try to explain it to you in just one or two simple terms. It's not too hard to know that what God ordained thousands of years ago, that God gave that as a reason and a pattern and a principle that we established, the family that God established many years ago, and it's never changed. Just because our Supreme Court passes a law that says we'll recognize this doesn't mean that's what we are. Just because the, the, the society we live in today says that a man can marry a man, that doesn't mean that's the pattern of God. The pattern of God has never changed. It's still a man and a woman. It's still a boy, a, a male and a female. And so just because some dum-dum in some high office of the land tries to pass some bill that says it's, it's okay for you to have two dads, it's a lie from the devil. I wish I had had a church that knew what I was talking about this morning don't buy into the lie don't drink the Kool-Aid don't accept what they're shoving down the throats of our children it's a lie it's a lie it's a lie and any other ideology any other philosophy any other idea 
that has tried to push through society to the, to the homes and families of our nation, let me tell you, it is rebellion against the word of God. Don't buy into it. Don't accept it. And don't let it just be casual to you. The reason the enemy advances is because the church is too casual. A quiet church is an open door. It's like swinging a prime rib in front of a lion. You don't want to do that. When you are quiet and you are casual and you are complacent, it is at that point the enemy advances. The enemy will always advance where there is no opposition. But the Bible says they came in and drove out the former inhabitants of the land. And if you're going to possess something, that's exactly what it means. To possess something means you got to go in and you got to take out what's in there. If you're going to change the world, you're going to have to step into something and drive out where the devil was. Come on, somebody. I don't care what Congress passes and and I don't care what laws are written in our Supreme Court and it doesn't matter to me what some senator or some president or some person, it doesn't matter to me what's trending on Twitter. It doesn't matter to me what's the latest social media craze. What matters to me is that we understand there is one thing that will save America from destruction and that is the function of the family as ordained from God by God for God. God today two men living together will never be a family two women living together will never be a family if you have a problem with that let me introduce you to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah Paul said in Romans chapter 1 when he described this kind of a relationship he ended those words in the text by saying that those who practice such thing are deserving of death. I'm not going to patty cake around it, church. I'm not going to play games with those things. Sin will take you to hell. Hell is eternal. And if you don't live right, that's where you're going to go. Somebody say, well, this church is a little too strong for me. I'd rather have a strong church and get to heaven than some weak, apathetic church and spend my eternity in hell. We need a word from the pulpits. We need someone who's going to proclaim a prophetic word to this generation and tell you if you don't live right, you're going to get left. You got to stand on the word of God. Don't accept what God doesn't accept. Don't buy into the lie that's come, come from hell today. Live right for God so what is the purpose of the family well Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28 God also gave us that pattern you see God's word is full of patterns and principles and if we just follow the patterns and principles of God's word then we're going to be just fine we're going to be just fine can somebody say amen And so Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, the Bible said, be fruitful and multiply and have children. It didn't say Moses wrote the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But Moses didn't write, be fruitful and multiply with cats and dogs. Sick and tired of these dog commercials. I mean, I love dogs. I have a dog. I have two dogs. Cats, I'm not so crazy about, but dogs I love. Cats have way too much attitude. They sit down, these marketing masters, they they sit down as they create their storyboards for a commercial, and they begin to lay out the plan. And they begin to to design how they're going to hit the seat of our emotion on a television commercial. So they pick the song that's going to bring tears to your eyes and put the saddest looking puppy dog on the screen and say, you know, for just $19 a month, uh, that's only a a coffee a day or whatever. You know, they'll use every ploy possible. And and then they try to tell you that you can save this dog from, uh, uh, you know, having to live in a kennel for the next few weeks or God forbid maybe going into uh, extinction but 
but, or termination or whatever they, you know, and that's sad. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to see a dog die, but I have a whole, whole lot more problem with hundreds and hundreds of babies that are slaughtered in Planned Parenthood places every day. We're crying about a doggy, but I'm not seeing a lot of adoption for baby children. I'm not seeing a lot of commercials on TV that said, why don't you become a foster child? I'm not seeing a lot of that stuff going on, but I see a little kitty cat. We've got numbers of families in our church that I love what they're doing. I've got families in our church, one we just dedicated the owners, that, that they, don't have to, they didn't have a vehicle big enough to bring all their babies to church that they, that they love and care for and they adopted and they brought in and, and, and all of their biological children. They just got an army of children and God bless them. God bless them. Not only give them a van, but if do you need a bigger house, get them a bigger house, God. God bless the Rhodes family. One of our one of our servant they serve here in the ministry. God bless them. God bless them. They got children. I know 936 of them. They got all kinds of children. I look at their family gatherings. And it's like how do you feed them all? The purpose of the family is to be fruitful and multiply and plan parenthood is devising the next sale of baby body parts. And I know that's a stark reality, but it's true. And it's all about money and murder. It's spawned in the incubators of hell. It's from the devil. And if the church doesn't begin to realize it, it's going to take over and America will be no more. But don't be discouraged this morning, church, because you're still the mighty army of God. You still got a voice. You still got something inside that says, I'm going to stand up. I'm not going to be quiet any longer. I'm going to speak up and let my voice be heard in the mighty name of Jesus I'm telling you they're murdering babies and in the courtrooms of heaven today they are convicted of first degree murder to multiply you have to reproduce there has to be a third to the two amen and if our birth rate in, in America, there are many nations of the world, their birth rate is less than 1.7%. If the birth rate drops below 1.7%, that nation will cease to exist. America today has a birth rate of 2.2. The reason it has a birth rate of 2.2 is often much of it due to the Spanish population. Thank you, Spanish folks. <laughs> Keep going. Hispanic. You have many, many different countries of the world. But if America did not have that additional birth rate, it would be at 1.7. The nation of Canada has a, popu a birth rate of 1.7. Within 20 to 25 years, Canada will be a full-fledged Muslim nation. The Muslim population in Canada is exploding. When Pastor Ellen and I moved to Florida 13 years ago, we sold our home. We had a 4,000 square foot home, beautiful home in Canada. It was bought by a family we were a family of six. I think a family of about 19 moved into it because the families work together. Even though they serve a false God, they live in a deception, but they work together because here's how that culture works. That culture does not live like you and I do. They don't live like, I hope I get enough money to retire. 
They don't live like, do I have enough in my 401k? Or do you think we should get a new car or wait till the kids move? They don't live like that. That culture lives four generations down the road. Their great, great, great grandparents are already making plans for the generations, four generations down the road. That's how they live. That's how they buy up every major real estate in nations. They move in. They take over. Let me tell you one more thing. When Americans and Canadians want to build a church, uh, they, they, they'll try to take an offering or have a, a bake sale. I'm believing God to sell enough apple pies this Saturday at the, at the tailgate sale to raise another $300 towards our $8.6 million project. Hallelujah. You want to know how the Muslims do it? They make a phone call. They go to City Hall, every one of them, with a check of no less than $5,000 in their hand. They'll have two to three hundred people come and they'll slap a check so big down on the, on, the, on the county commissioner's table that the county commissioners can't say no because the money's there. And they uh, literally in one night, they will push an agenda through that most people would take 30 years. That's a fact. I built numbers of churches. I know what I'm talking about. To multiply, you have to reproduce or you will become extinct as a nation the traditional family is the only family that God recognizes God does not recognize a family that is living outside of biblical standards I did not say that God does not love them. God loves everybody. God loves every sinner. You can never devalue yourself in the eyes of God by the level of sin that you commit. He loves everybody and values everybody the same. But the family was ordained of God. Families celebrate one another. Families respect one another. Families love one another. That's why I cringe when I hear someone say, my old man. If you ever refer to me as your old man, I'll send you down the highway <laughs> with a boot in your behind. No, no son or daughter should ever refer to their father that way. That is not respect. That's not honoring your father. Can I at least get 185 amens? <laughs> then the Bible says, give me a few more minutes. The Bible says this, husbands, you ought to love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, when I marry couples in this church, how many couples have I married? If you got married by me, raise your hand. Wave your hand. Wave your hand all over here. They're all over here. I probably married 15 couples in this church. When I tie that knot, I tie that knot so tight that no devil in hell could ever break it. Amen? I mean, I tie that thing. I tie that thing tight. And the plan and, and pattern of God is for husbands to love their wives. I'm not bragging, but I'm just going to brag for a minute. But I really do fall just a little bit more in love with my wife every day. Amen. A little bit more. Now, wouldn't that be a whole lot better than someone who falls out of love a little bit more every day? But you know, the reality is many of our marriages, they're falling out of love. They take each other for granted. They don't honor and respect one another, but that's not the pattern of God. The pattern of God says, husbands, love your wives. It didn't say love them on the honeymoon and then forget about them. It didn't say love them the first year of marriage. It said love them every day you're together until death do you part. And then, and, then, and then men say, well, I don't know why she doesn't honor me. I do. I know why she doesn't honor you. Because women, and I told the first service, I don't have women all figured out. But I've been around long enough to know that women will respond 
Trust me. I know what I'm talking about. When my wife comes in the bedroom on Sunday morning out of the closet, the walk-in closet, she doesn't sleep in the closet. Don't start that rumor. She sleeps in bed with me. She goes into the closet, gets her dress, comes out, and she says, what do you think of this dress? And I know as strong and secure and wonderful and as amazing and, and, and self-reliant and just a tower of strength, a Proverbs 31 woman, I know that at that point, I don't really have a chance. I've got to respond with the right words or there's going to be a problem. <laughs> Only a fool. <laughs> Only a foolish man would say, honey, I, I, I don't think so. That's, uh, yeah, that just makes everything. No, just, you know, honey, you're a good looking woman, but that's just not, you know, you'd have to be crazy to talk like that. And I can watch my wife when I tell her how much I love her. Her strength comes alive. And she's secure. I'm not talking about an insecure woman here. I'm talking about a very, listen, she could run General Motors. I'm not talking about that. The Bible says husbands love your wives. Why do you think God said that? The Bible says that because that's the pattern of God. The pattern of God that if a husband truly loves his wife, if a husband loves his wife according to the things of God, then that wife will honor her husband. She is designed to honor the man that God puts in her life. And if, and if you love, if he loves you, you will respond to that thing called, you will honor him. You will do uh, what God designed you to do. And he will be who God designed him to be. Love your wives. And then secondly, husbands provide, fathers provide for your own. You know, the Bible says whoever doesn't provide for his own is worse than an infidel. An infidel is the very lowest of the low in the, in the, uh, the bottom dwellers of the scum of society. That's pretty low. Worse than an infidel. A father who does not provide his, for his own is worse than an infidel. But tragically today, America is filled with infidels. America today and the reason we see what we're seeing is because there are so many fathers that have abdicated their throne. Anybody can, can father a child, but it's a whole different thing to be a father. Not a, not a, uh, I've got to say this right. <laughs> One night stand, whatever you want to call it. Because being born a male is a 50-50 chance, but being born a, um, or being a man is a choice. We make a choice to be a father. Fathers have more men. Outside of God, there are things men desire. I said it's the early service, and this is where the rebuke part came in, but I'm going to say it anyways. I want Because I want you to get this. Men. Men are designed. We're the hunter. We're the pursuer. We're the provider. We're the strength. We're that, the one they run to. But men really only want just a few things in life. It's true. We need to send a message to men that, that that's not what life is, life is all about. Life is so much more. Life is about being a father, not just fathering a child. It's about being a father. It's about being a leader to that child. Let me, let me just share with you a couple statistics and then I'm going to close. The American home suffers from absentee fathers. I'm thankful for this church. We got some of the greatest men and greatest fathers. So I'm, I'm telling you this. You know why. I'm telling you this and those that are watching online today so that they understand how important it is to be the father God designed you to be. The American home suffers from absentee fathers. 60% of rapists, 72% of underage murderers, 70% of long-term prisoners grew up in fatherless homes. Now maybe you did and maybe you turned out fine. But you're the exception and not the rule. The National Census Bureau says 80% of American children live in homes without their biological fathers. 
They do not know who their daddy is. Four out of ten children are born to unwed mothers, not including abortions. What does God, church, think this morning about fathers who fail to fulfill the responsibility in the biblical pattern that God told us to follow? Well, he answers that in in Malachi 4, verse 6, and he says that God will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. But listen, that's not where the verse ends because it goes on to say, or else. So don't just rejoice. We we thank God. God's going to turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children. That's wonderful. But then he goes on to say, or else, or else what? Or else, God says, he will come and strike that nation with a curse. God will send judgment upon a nation that the the failures of where fathers fail to lead and love and provide and be the head of their homes. There are three functions I'm going to close with today. That as fathers in this room, fathers and families, that God said these are the three areas that are most important in your life. Number one, God said you're called, Dad, to be a priest. You're called to be a priest. If I don't go by way of the rapture, and if I go by way of the grave, and my son does my funeral one day, I know that's a little morbid, but... He's probably the guy that's going to do it. I didn't tell him that yet. Is he around? (laughs) 30, 40 years from now. That I pray he doesn't eulogize me like this. Hey, you know, my dad, man, he was a great golfer. Man, he knew how to golf, you know. Hey, I remember my dad gave me my first beer. I'll never forget that one, yeah. Uh, that's, that's how some fathers think, guys, you're so much more than that. You're so much more than just that. Let it be said, I remember my dad wasn't perfect. My dad. The greatest dads, by the way, are the ones who can say, you know, son, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Uh, would you forgive me for that, you know? There's nothing wrong with that once in a while. I had to say I was wrong once back in 87. (laughs) I'm teasing. You're called to be a priest, dads. You're called to be a priest. You know what a priest is? In the Old Testament, the Bible says when they, the angel of death was flying over the land of, of Egypt and the nation at the time, that the priest was the father of the home. And he was the one that God said, you're the one not to turn to your son in the house, your nine-year-old, and say, son, I'm a little busy right now. Uh, I'm watching the last game of the Major League Baseball series. And would you mind doing me a favor? There's a little bit of hyssop out in the garage. Hey, I killed a lamb yesterday morning, drained the blood into a bucket. Would you mind getting the hyssop? I just want you to paint. They said that if we paint some blood on the doorpost of the homes, then that, what they call, I guess they call it the angel of death, will fly over and it'll spare all the children. Son, would you mind doing that? I don't have time to get her. That's not what a priest does. A priest, the Bible says, will take that which God ordained in the pattern. And he said he'll take a bit of hyssop and he'll dip it in the blood of a sacrificial lamb. And the priest, being the father of the home, will become the protector of the home, will be the priest of the home. And he will say, I don't care what's flying overhead of my home. I'm going to make sure that the hand of God is covering my babies. Listen to me, church. There is an angel of death that is flying over America today. It's been flying over this nation for a long time. And because there's been a lack of fatherhood and a lack of true fathers in our nation, that angel of death has been allowed to fly in under the cover of Planned Parenthood. It's been allowed to fly in under the cover of human trafficking. It's been allowed to fly in under cover in many different ways of gang warfare and drugs and addiction and alcohol and that angel of death because the daddies that should have been posting or painting the doorposts of their home with the blood of Jesus Christ have abdicated their position have ran away from their responsibility and thank God for fathers who will stand up and say I'll be the priest of my home I will lead the way I will be the man of God I'm not ashamed for my little boy and my little girl to hear me pray 
say out loud, I'm not ashamed to let my children see my hands stretched high in the air and tears rolling down my face. I'm not ashamed to, uh, to let my babies know that daddy's not perfect, but daddy's a man of God. And you won't see me sleeping in bed on a Sunday morning because I'll get up and I'll say to my family, get up, we're going to church. That's the kind of fathers we're looking for today. What's all this nonsense about your father being your friend? You were never called to be your child's friend. You were called to be their fathers and their mothers. So as the priest of the home, God said, number one, you're a priest. Number two, you're a prophet. As a prophet, you're the protector. You're the, you're the Noah. That God says, there's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. And ironically, in the Bible, God said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Men. There's a storm coming. The ark is open. The door on the side has swung open wide for all to come. Whosoever will, he said, may come. I love what Jesus said or God said when he spoke to Noah. He didn't say go. He said come. Because God was already in the ark. He didn't say pushing him in from the outside. But he said come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. God needs to be in our homes again. That God needs to be in our churches again. God needs to be in our pulpits again. God needs to be in your mouth and in your mind again, man. God needs to be in your heart. God, the presence of God. And that's what your babies will follow. That's what your children will run after. 